I tend to try to speak positively about climate action and the energy transition because I think we can build a better world as we move away from fossil fuels. But sometimes when it's a dreary November day, I think it's right to have a reality check. Particularly when climate negotiations in Brazil are in the news, it's probably worthwhile checking up on how we are doing when it comes to climate change. You see, a mate of mine is an academic whose research focuses on ice loss around the world. He's tracking the retreat of, or amongst other things, he's tracking the retreat of glaciers, the loss of ice at the poles, and the impacts of that loss of ice on society around the world. Some of his research was picked up in the news, in news outlets a couple of months ago, um, and I'll link to one or two of the articles below. I found it fairly difficult reading at the time. And after chatting last week, um, Chris sent a new paper to me from some climate academics who work at a range of universities and institutes around the world, um, referencing the latest research from a range of fields that cover climate science. The paper they've published is what they call a state of the climate report that gives an overview on where we are when it comes to the key indicators linked to climate change. The subtitle of the paper is A Planet on the Brink. So this paper is not very long, it's only 10 pages if you skip the references at the end. And I guess we don't need many words, we don't need a long paper to make the point. But what it is, is it's heavy with data and conclusions about what climate change really means in 2025. And from where I sit, the conversation around climate change seems to have got a bit confused in recent months as if action we're taking is optional, as if we could be happy with the status quo, as if we don't have anything to gain from transitioning away from fossil fuels. So I thought I would profile this paper here because I think it gives a little bit of a helpful wake up call about where we are in the climate change story, about where we're up to in all this change and a wake up call about the level of action needed. So let's have a look at some of the detail in the paper. The paper sets out a, a range of data that is relevant to climate change. First of all, it states that in 2024, we saw a new mean global surface temperature record. It shows that energy consumption of oil, coal and gas are at their highest ever. And on the other hand, it shows that energy generated by solar and wind is also at its highest. It shows that CO2 per emissions per year are at their highest ever, although it shows that Per person per capita, CO2 emissions have more or less plateaued at five tonnes of CO2 over the last 20 years. It shows that tree cover loss is at a near peak, including a peak in tree cover loss due to fires, even if, as it shows, deforestation of the Amazon is, at, is now a 40 year low. It shows the concentration of three key gases when we think about climate change, CO2, methane and nitrous oxide. It shows that they're at the highest on record. It shows that the oceans contain the highest amount of heat on record. It shows that sea level change of nearly 100 millimetres, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's meaningful relative to the 20 year mean. It shows upward trends of extremely hot days. It shows downward trends in Arctic, Greenland, Antarctic and glacier ice. It provides a list of climate related disasters since 2024 that, although not purely caused by climate change, may well have been intensified by climate change. And this includes wildfires, heavy precipitation and flooding, and extreme temperatures. The paper sets out risks associated with climate change and the things that we are reliant on on our day to day, including um, the signs of a weak, the, the weakening of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, that helps give Northwest Europe warmer and more stable weather. It sets out risks to our fresh water resources. It sets out risk of further warming and it sets out the pace of change of temperature around the world. It also sets out some of the ways that we could respond to this data, how we could mitigate the worst of climate change. And it sets out some conclusions that are really quite clear. And I almost want to read out the whole conclusion to you here, but I'm, I'm going to leave you through that if you wanted to look at the paper yourself, but some highlights from the conclusion. It says that the accelerating climate crisis is now a major driver of global instability. It says without a strategy that embeds climate resilience into policy, cascading risks may overwhelm systems of peace, governance, and public and ecosystem health. 
and it says that avoiding every fraction of a degree is of warming is critically important. So this state of the climate report is a concise but alarming overview of exactly that, the state of the climate. It's a clear call to action. It's leadership in an age of distraction. So I occasionally get comments on my channel from people suggesting that the climate science doesn't stack up or isn't conclusive or that even worse, it's trying to mislead us. And I don't expect this video or this paper to convince those people otherwise. For some, up is down, left is right, climate change is not happening. But I choose to trust this wide range of leading academics and to trust the data that they have referenced and the data that they have published. And I would ask those who cast doubt on the science to, to, to explain the data reported in this paper, to explain the peaks in what we measure in nature alongside the peaks in our emissions. I also sometimes get comments on my channel from people suggesting that even if the science stacks up, it isn't on little old Blighty to do anything about it. Well, you know what, I disagree. I suggest that every ton of CO2 is important. And as the paper says, every fraction of a degree of warming is critically important. I point out that we are responsible for our fair share of emissions today, about 1% of emissions, and we're about 1% of global population. But I also point out that since the Industrial Revolution, we're probably responsible for about 4% of total emissions. So maybe we've taken well more th than our fair share in, 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 in emitting so far. I also point out that 75% of the energy delivered in our economy today is still from fossil fuels. And I point out that in trying to work towards decarbonizing our economy, we can do a few things at the same time. We can lead internationally, showing our neighbors and our partners that we're willing to put the hard work in, to do our part and to do more. But more than that, we can take advantage of cleaning up our economy, achieving low cost, abundant, clean energy to power our lives, to increase comfort in our buildings, to power low emissions transport that's better than conventional transport. And in achieving a clean economy, we can breathe cleaner air and we can increase our energy security. I suggest that we can do our part linked to climate change and deliver a better country at the same time. So I take this paper as a bit of a wake up call for all of us that action is required wherever we have CO2 emissions. A wake, up call that we can, a wake up call that we can do more and do it quicker. A wake up call that despite what we see internationally, there are still things that we can do, that we can encourage and that we can influence. So what are those things? What really am I talking about? Well, I think a lot of this conversation is overcomplicated. It's full of distractions, distractions that are sometimes by design to slow down the transition or distractions that are trying to eke out profit from the transition with something that might lead us down an unhelpful path. I think the problem simply is fossil fuels and the solution is that we need to burn less of them. And we have the technology, we need to do that across our economy today. So in homes, we can burn less fossil fuels by switching away from gas, switching away from gas boilers and moving to electric heating which for many of us is likely to mean installing an air source heat pump. If that seems too drastic in the short term, we could make sure our system is operating as efficiently as possible and we can work to reduce heat loss by improving insulation and reducing drafts. And as we travel around, we should work to use less petrol and diesel by driving less, by using public transport, by walking and riding bikes, and ultimately by switching to an electric vehicle. An electric vehicle will reduce emissions compared to a fossil fuel vehicle today. And if so, if we have to drive, we should drive electric. We could look to install solar panels at home, but in the UK, our electricity is already really clean. Solar panels can support in reducing costs for our day to day lives and they can contribute to cleaning the grid that bit further. But in the UK, they won't really have a major impact on emissions. In a similar way, we could look to install a battery at home. And this could help the grid more broadly take advantage of that, that variable renewable generation that we have today. And it could help us reduce costs for an electrified home. But again, it won't do a huge amount to reduce our emissions. And in our communities and workplaces, the places we go day to day, where we use fossil fuels for heating or transport, we really should be asking the question, what's the plan to move away from natural gas or petrol or diesel? Many, if not most, of our school buildings, our colleges, our universities will be heated by gas boilers today. 
literally gaslighting a generation as we teach that climate change is an issue we should be responding to. All buildings can be heated by heat pumps. So we should do the work to design systems, retrofit systems to, to install them, to fundraise to install them, and then to actually install a low carbon heating system, maybe supported by solar panels. And we should be doing that across our communities. Our public transport can electrify. We could charge buses at the depot overnight, driving around our cities during the day, topping up with charge or brakes for drivers where we need to. And we can electrify the rest of our railway around the UK. Our cities can be made friendlier to people, making walking and cycling safer. Nationally, we still get about a third of our electricity from gas power stations. And we should look to push that down by supporting the inst installation of wind farms and solar farms and through working to minimise when we use electricity using electricity when the weather is still or dark. But you know what, in moving to electric transport and electric heating, we're already contributing to helping that grid get cleaner because we can take advantage of charging a car or, 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 or charging up a hot water tank when renewable energy is, is thriving, is flying. Using more electricity helps make the case for more renewable investment. It helps bring down the cost of electricity for everyone. And that could help other people make a similar decision to decarbonise heat and decarbonise transport. And although one thing that's really important to note, our electricity system is already really clean and already we can use electricity across the board to reduce emissions. What else nationally? Well, government could change the system by altering taxes to incentivise reduction in fossil fuel use. They could make a frequent flyer levy on flights. They could move taxes and levies away from electricity onto fossil fuels. An industry could invest in electrification and in energy efficiency to help make it more competitive in a globalised economy using low cost, low emissions electricity to drive processes that used to be fossil based. And on top of that, we can continue to innovate to find new ways of providing the energy that we need to improve standards of living, to reduce costs and to reduce emissions whilst we deliver on the solutions that we already have today. We shouldn't be waiting for something new when we can reduce sub emissions substantially with heat pumps and electric vehicles powered by wind turbines and solar panels supported by batteries. We have everything we need today to decarbonise our, our economy substantially. In my work over the last few years, I've helped set out the solution to decarbonise leisure centres, um, large fleets of maintenance vehicles, other public buildings, a Russell Group University and its buildings and activities as well as a number of church buildings, community-owned buildings and small businesses. In each case, with the will and with some investment and with some time and effort, we can find a strategy and we can turn that strategy into a delivery plan and we can reduce emissions substan substantially. We can do that today in 2025. We don't need to wait. And if you'd like to explore how you might respond to that wake-up call in that state of the climate, paper um, and this video, how you might reduce emissions substantially today, what you might need to do at home, in your community, in your business, wherever you see fossil fuel use. I would be thrilled to have a conversation with you about that. So please do get in touch with, uh, with me through my website sb-energy.co.uk and let's see what we can do together. And then finally, if you haven't already, I promise there'll be more good news in the future, but please do hit subscribe to my channel sign up to my mailing list, have a look at our low carbon book club that's about to start and join the technology revolution.